Hello, this is Dr. Gardner. Today we'll be talking about how to draw Lewis structures for molecular compounds. So we need to focus on the type of bonding that goes on in molecular compounds. First of all, in molecular compounds we have covalent bonds where we have two or more uh, nonmetals that are sharing electrons between their outer orbitals in order to stabilize their electron configurations so that the, in the molecules they end up sharing those electrons to complete their outer valence shell or their outer orbitals. As we do that and we share those electrons, we form what we call a covalent bond. So there are no electrons transferred, which is what we had seen in ionic bonding situations. The electrons as said are shared between these nonmetals. Now when we have electrons involved that are shared between two atoms, that those are our covalent bonds and there's two shared electrons for every covalent bond that we look at between those nonmetal atoms. If there are more than two, we may have a situation where we have a multiple bond with either a double or a triple bond when there are four or six valence electrons shared between the same two atoms. However, there can also be orbitals filled with electrons that are not shared between the atoms. Electrons that are pairs of valence electrons that are not involved in the covalent bond are called lone pairs or non-bonding electron pairs. Okay. When we draw Lewis structures, we will show lines to indicate covalent bonds, and we will show uh, pairs of dots to indicate lone pairs or non-bonding electrons in the course. So when I draw a Lewis structure of a molecular compound, just realize that we are following this type of notation. Shared electrons are lines to indicate covalent bonds, or sometimes we may show a pair of dots between the two atom symbols that also indicates a covalent bond, but I will in many situations show a single line which also represents those two electrons instead. So you can eat more readily differentiate between uh, dots that are lone pairs or non-bonding electrons when we show the Lewis structures. Now, as we look at the first row on the periodic table, we have hydrogen and helium. We're filling a 1s subshell there, and that first uh, shell that we're looking at can only hold two electrons, so it kind of follows a duet rule. As soon as we have two electrons, as we have electron configuration the same as helium, we have gained stability. However, as we look at the second and third period on the periodic table, as soon as we gain eight electrons in the S and P subshells for the valence electrons, we have completed their, those two orbitals, and we follow what we call an octet rule. So in many cases, what we'll be seeing in our Lewis structures is we will have up to eight electrons shown as dots or lines in the molecular compound to indicate that we have then formed a stable molecule with the bonding. So we look for this octet rule to be followed. So my elements in the second and third period will tend to have eight valence electrons shown around them. These valence electrons may be present either in covalent bonds with lines shown, with two electrons for every line that we're showing, or as the lone pairs or non-bonding pairs, which will be my Lewis electron dots and my structure that are not represented as lines in this course. Okay, so let's consider if we're looking at the Lewis electron dot structure of two free atoms. Let's look at two fluorine atoms. Now, if I have two fluorine atoms, we'll find that they have uh, their valence shell incompletely filled. They each have seven electrons in their valence shell, and so I'm only looking at these valence electrons. We're ignoring the core electrons. So those seven valence electrons are shown as seven dots around the Lewis structures, similar to what you would have seen in my previous video on writing Lewis electron dot structures for for ionic compounds. Now, if we consider these two fluorine atoms, though neither one wants to lose electrons to form ions in this case, they both have the same desire to try to gain an extra electron to fulfill their outer valence shell to have an octet of electrons, which will give them an electron configuration just like neon. Now in this case, since they don't, neither one wants to lose an electron, but they both would like to gain one, they can overlap their outer orbitals, and we can end up, as we're indicating here in the Lewis structure, with one orbital half filled. So if I look at these electrons in my Lewis structure. These are indicating that one of my orbitals in those valence shell electrons is half filled. If we were to overlap these half filled orbitals, we could form a covalent bond. So I can show this by showing the symbols of the two fluorine atoms 
in close proximity to one another, and then the two electrons that are shown between them here in the middle indicate a single covalent bond. Now, any electrons present in covalent bonds can be counted towards the total number of valence electrons for both of these nonmetal atoms that are sharing those electrons. So we can treat both of those in the count of their valence shells. So if I look at the fluorine on the left, I can count my valence electrons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it has a total of 8 valence electrons because it is sharing the 2 in the covalent bond. The other fluorine atom also can be treated as if it has 8 valence electrons because when we count up the number of electrons present to stabilize the second fluorine's orbitals, we can also count the electrons in the bond towards its total. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 with that additional electron shared by the second fluorine. So they both have followed the octet rule and have gained extra stability. So both of the fluorines in a diatomic fluorine molecule that we often has, have written as F2 are stabilized in these packets of two because they both are treated as if they have a full valence shell with the electron configuration like neon in this situation. This is why you learned that the diatomic elements of hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine all end up having stability in packets of two with these diatomic molecules because if you draw their Lewis structures, you'll find that they end up fulfilling uh, their octet rules or duet rules with a complete valence shell of electrons as long as they come in packets of two. That's why they're stable that way. And that's why in the beginning of the course, I had you memorize that information. Now, there's two ways to represent covalent bonds. We've shown one of them here with the two dots between the fluorines. Uh, but there's another way we can show this. If I've, if I've shown it that way, the two dots that are shown between the symbols of the fluorines will indicate a single covalent bond. Remember, every two electrons shared between the two nonmetals represent one bond. Okay, now every one of the electron pairs which are not involved in that bond are considered lone pairs. So if I asked you in the fluorine molecule how many lone pairs there were, you'd say there's one, two, three, four, five, six lone pairs. I might also call them non-bonding pairs of electrons. So if I say how many non-bonding pairs of electrons we have in the fluorine molecule, we'd also say there's six pairs. Or we could say that there's 12 electrons involved in those lone pairs or non-bonding groups. And and then if we asked how many electrons are involved in covalent bonds in the structure, we could say that there's two electrons involved in a single covalent bond. Now, in order to differentiate these, sometimes it's useful to show a line between the fluorine atoms. A line between the fluorine atoms indicates that we have a single covalent bond in that location. And then every pair of electrons that are not involved in a covalent bond in this course, I will usually show as dots to indicate lone pairs or non-bonding pairs. Now, I should uh, specify that in some courses, you'll see lines shown for the lone pairs, but those lines will not connect to non-metals, and that's how you could differentiate between the lines. Sometimes that's done because it's a slightly faster shorthand notation to quickly draw a structure. So if you were to use that that type of notation, which I usually will not use in this course, we could show the two fluorine atoms with their covalent bond. And then we could also indicate the lone pairs or non-bonding groups of electrons with that shorthand notation quickly by just saying there's a lone pair here, 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 and here. Now I think that can be confusing for first-time chemistry students because they're showing lines for everything, whether they're bonds or lone pairs or non-bonding groups of electrons. So I usually will use this notation where we will try to differentiate with lines for covalent bonds, but remember a single covalent bond actually involves two electrons that we had originally shown as a pair of dots. Okay, And then I will try to show dots for all my non-bonding pairs or lone pairs of electrons just so it's easy to differentiate between the two. Okay, so let's look at the Lewis structure for water. One way you can start to predict a lot of my Lewis structures is to look at the Lewis electron dot structure for the individual elements. So if I look at hydrogen, hydrogen has just a single electron and it's 1s subshell. And in fact, if I look at the electron configuration, there's a 1s1 electron configuration for this hydrogen. Water, there's an oxygen. When I look at my oxygen, well, there's a helium core. And I'm going to leave the core electrons out of the Lewis structure. The, the electrons in that helium core will not be used in the bonding processes. It's only going to be the valence electrons. So if I look at oxygen, oxygen has a 2s2 electron configuration. And it has a, a 2p4 
for the last part of it, it's electron configuration. And so if I count up the superscripts of all the electrons in the electron configuration, we can see there's four, five, six valence electrons. So in the Lewis structure, I show there's one, two, three, four, five, six. So you'll notice there's two orbitals that are completely filled on Oshin's Lewis structure. And then we have two half filled orbitals with only one electron in them. And it's these half filled orbitals that we predict will be involved in covalent bonding in this situation. Now we have a second uh, hydrogen atom in water because it's H2O. There's two hydrogens. It also has a 1s1 electron configuration. So you notice both the hydrogens have just a half filled electron orbital. So if we look at oxygen, we can fulfill oxygen's octet to have eight electrons if it were to share an electron in its half-filled orbital with the half-filled orbital from one hydrogen and share another electron with the half-filled orbital of the second hydrogen. So we can end up with a covalent bond in these two locations. Now, however, we notice the hydrogen does not follow the rule after we end up forming my uh, Lewis structure. The hydrogens just follow a duet rule because as soon as I fill up the 1s subshell, we have a completely filled valence shell and we have stability like that of helium. Okay, so if I were to draw the Lewis structure one way we could draw this is we could go ahead and show the hydrogens and oxygens in close proximity. We can see that we have a covalent bond in this location and a covalent bond in this location. And then we have two lone pairs. So here's a lone pair on the oxygen. So there's one there. And then there's another lone pair on the oxygen here. So now we can treat oxygen as if it has eight valence electrons because it is sharing them in covalent bonds with the hydrogens. And the hydrogens have two valence electrons each as long as they're sharing those electrons with the oxygen in the center of the structure. Now if we look at the entire uh, Lewis structure of the water molecule, if we start to use a notation where those pairs of electrons involved in covalent bonds are shown as lines. So each line represents two electrons. We can see we have two single covalent bonds in the water molecule structure. And we see we have two lone pairs. Now I'm going to give you a tip. When I usually look at structures that have multiple lone pairs, I like to, when I draw them on a flat surface, when I'm not looking at a three-dimensional model, to help me see the structure, I like to show those covalent bonds are lone pairs adjacent to one another. So I might draw water like this. So I show the single bonds of the hydrogen adjacent to one another and I show these lone pairs. They're involved in bonding. Okay. If I show them adjacent to one another, we can see this is a bent molecule. There's a bent structure to it. Whereas if I look at it this way, I may incorrectly assume that this is a linear molecule. This is not linear. It's actually a bent molecule. And in fact, if we were to, to measure this bond angle, it's 104.5. So we end up with not having 90 degree angles. And we'll talk about that more when we start talking about electron geometry. So I'll talk about that here in the next set of videos. Okay, so let's consider situations where we have more than a single bond. Sometimes to form a stable molecule, we will have shared more than two electrons between the nonmetal atoms that are involved in that molecule. If we share four pair four electrons involved in two pairs, we could end up with a double bond. So let's consider carbon dioxide. So if I'm looking at carbon dioxide here, CO2, we're going to have basically <coughs> two oxygen atoms, which each came with one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. And if we could think about carbon, well, carbon has a total of four valence electrons, one, two, three, four in the Lewis structure. So it has four orbitals that are half filled, so it can overlap up to four orbitals, whereas the oxygen can overlap up to two orbitals. So what if we have each oxygen overlap two orbitals with the carbon? Now that wouldn't satisfy the octet rule for carbon of only one oxygen bonded. However, we could have a second oxygen overlap two orbitals and the bond with the other two valence electrons here. Okay, and that could form the second set of two covalent bonds. And so we can end up drawing the structure like this. We have carbon uh, sharing a total of two of its valence electrons with two of oxygen's valence electrons. And now we have a full octet for this oxygen here on the left. And then if we end up with carbon sharing two more of its valence electrons with two valence electrons from oxygen on the right, we end up having a full octet on that oxygen. And the center carbon, since it's overlapping all four orbitals, 
and sharing a total of two more electrons from each of the oxygens has a full octet as well. So I could show my carbon dioxide with double bonds this way, or a lot of times we can indicate every two electrons involved in covalent bonds as a line. So I can show double bonds as double lines between the oxygens and the carbons. Now if I count the number of electrons on this carbon here, with respect to how stable it is, we count two per line. So I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's the full octet on this carbon. This oxygen on the right counts two electrons for every line. It can count all the electrons that are shared between the covalent bonds towards its total. So it has one, two, three, four for the double bonds. And then for the lone pairs or non-bonding pairs, we get five, six, seven, eight. So everybody has a full octet in that case. So be aware of when we're going to use these double lines as we start to, to draw uh, Lewis structures for covalent bonded molecules. Now if we have a triple bond, a triple bond will now start to overlap more orbitals. In this case we're going to overlap three orbitals that are half filled on nitrogens. So let's think about nitrogen's Lewis structure. If we look at an individual nitrogen atom, we have one, two, three, four, five valence electrons in nitrogen. Right, because if I look at its electron configuration, it has the outer shell with a 2s2 and a 2p3. Right, so I have three half-filled orbitals. If I look at another nitrogen atom with its uh, Lewis electron dot structure, there's an orbital that's filled, and then I have three half-filled orbitals. And so to form a stable diatomic molecule in order to form diatomic nitrogen, N2 that we've learned occurs in packets of two in nature, we must have overlapped one of the half-filled orbitals on each of the nitrogens to form the first single covalent bond. And then we end up forming multiple bonds by overlapping more orbitals. So if I overlap the net set, that would form a double bond. If we overlap one set of the last third half-filled set of orbitals, we end up with having a triple bond. So we end up with having six electrons shared between the two nitrogens. So I show this as a triple bond with three lines. Okay, so that's going to indicate my triple bond. Now if I count my number of electrons around each nitrogen, we can count the total from all the bonds towards their totals to see if they follow the octet rule, whether or not they have the eight electrons around them. So this nitrogen count one, two, and then two per line, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it counts towards this octet. The other nitrogen also will count towards an octet of eight. So that's when we predict stability. So now we know how to draw uh, simple molecular compounds with covalent bonds in their Lewis structures when we start to show lines for pairs of electrons shared between those nonmetals. We also realize that if we have a double or a triple bond, we can show two or three lines indicating either four or six electrons being shared. Okay, so we'll be using these skills and this knowledge when we're drawing Lewis structure uh, for the rest of this video as well as for the next videos. Now, if we consider a covalent bond, realize that the bond lengths that we measure will be the distance between the two nuclei of the covalent bonded atoms in the molecule. So these bond lengths will depend on what atoms are involved. For example, if I have two hydrogen atoms bonded, the distance between the nuclei of the first hydrogen atom and the second hydrogen atom is measured as 74 picometers. So the bond length in a single bond between hydrogen atoms and H2 molecules is 74 picometers. However, if I have a hydrogen bonded to another atom, let's say we have a larger atom like iodine, if we have those two nonmetals bonded together, the distances between their two nuclei when they're overlapping their outer orbitals in their Lewis structure for a single covalent bond is 161 picometers. So we notice that bond length will increase as we have one of the nonmetals increasing in size. So with a larger iodine, we ended up with getting a longer bond. So that's one thing you can remember for predicting bond lengths. Larger atoms that are involved in the covalent bond involved with longer bonds. Now if we start to have uh, double or triple bonds, as you form a double or triple bond and overlap those additional orbitals, the bond length will tend to decrease in size. So the general trend we expect if we have bonds between the same types of atoms. So I'm making sure they're between the same types of atoms so we don't have the atom size changing the bond length. So let's say we're looking at carbon atoms. If I have two carbon atoms with just a single covalent bond, and I'm not showing the rest of the structure here, just focusing on the bonding. If I have a single covalent bond, that's going to be the longest type of bond between those two atoms we have. But if we have two 
two carbon atoms that have a double bond between them, we expect that the bond length will be shorter. And if we have two carbon atoms with a triple bond between them, as we overlap those three orbitals, we have the shortest bond. So realize that bond length is going to be longest for single bonds between the same types of atoms intermediate in length for double bonds, and shortest for triple bonds. That's a very useful thing to remember. And in fact, if we want to measure these, a carbon to carbon single bond is about 154 picometers. A carbon to carbon double bond is about 133 picometers. And a carbon to carbon triple bond is about 120 picometers. Now, if I were to put another atom present, a slightly uh, different size atom like nitrogen present in my structure. Now nitrogen is a little bit smaller than carbon because as we go from left to right on the periodic table, my sizes decrease as I increase the number of protons in the nucleus. So since nitrogen is a little bit smaller than carbon, if I have a single bond between carbon and nitrogen, their single bond length is a little shorter. So I have to look at the sizes of the atoms. A smaller atom like nitrogen will involve a shorter bond length between their nuclei. However, if I do form a double bond between carbon and nitrogen, the size again decreases as I start to form multiple bonds. If I had a triple bond between carbon and nitrogen, we'd have the smallest size. But you'll notice whenever we go to those smaller atoms, if we're looking at single bonds and comparing them, the smaller inv atoms involved, the shorter the bond. If I have a double bond, the smaller the atoms involved, we tend to have slightly uh, different size bonds, but it also involves what's going on with what's going on with the uh, bonding in greater detail, but if we look at the carbon to carbon triple bond versus carbon to nitrogen triple bond, we definitely see that we're consistent with that shorter bond length here. Okay, now one thing we can talk about, if we have a triple bond, we can sometimes talk about that as a bond order of three. If we have a double bond, that's a bond order of two. If we have a single bond, that's a bond order of one. And so if you hear us talking about bond orders, realize the bond order is just equal to the number of shared electron pairs between the atoms. So bond order is always three for a triple bond, two for a double bond, and one for a single bond. Okay, now in order to make greater predictions with drawing Lewis structures, we have to understand a concept called electronegativity. So if I'm looking at electronegativity, this will be important in predicting how polar my bonds might be. Now if I'm looking at two nonmetals, the more polar a covalent bond is, we'll have a larger difference in electronegativity between the two atoms. Now let's think about what electronegativity is. Electronegativity is the ability of, not, of my atoms to attract electrons towards itself in a chemical bond. So the more electronegative an atom is, the more it pulls the electrons that are present in that bond towards itself. So fluorine is high on the electronegativity scale, whereas hydrogen is very low on the electronegativity scale. So I might say that fluorine is very electronegative, and I may say that hydrogen is fairly electropositive. So with that in mind, we can say that hydrogen is electron poor in the molecule HF, hydrogen fluoride, or in water, hydrofluoric acid whereas fluorine is very electron rich. Now we haven't completely transferred electrons. If we were to completely transfer electrons, if these electronegativities were such a large difference between them that we would transfer the electron, we would form ionic compounds. In that case, we would no longer show lines for covalent bonds. We would in that case indicate charges and the electrons would all reside on the anion and would have been lost from the cation. In this case, we don't have that strong of a difference between electronegativities. So even though we have a polar bond where the electrons are not shared equally, we end up having a still a covalent bond present. There is still some sharing going on. So because of this, I don't show positive and negative charges. I show a Greek letter lowercase delta. So this symbol is a lowercase Greek delta. What I'm indicating there is I have a partial charge. I have an incomplete sharing of electrons in the molecule where we have more electron density, a more electron rich region around the fluorine atom with this delta negative and electron positive region with this delta positive. So in that case sometimes we'll show computer models with color coding where the red regions are usually electron rich and the bluer regions are usually electron poor.
Okay. Now this tells me I have a polar molecule. And the reason we care about polar molecules is they help us predict basically the physical properties that we will tend to have here. The more polar your molecule is, well then the more strongly it will be attracted to other polar molecules through either what we will learn later is called hydrogen bonding or what we will talk about as being involved with uh, dipole-dipole interactions which will cause physical properties like boiling points and melting points to be higher the more polar your molecules are. For example, water molecules are quite polar, so the boiling point for water is very high compared to other molecules with similar masses where the molecules are less polar, where the electronegativity differences are less that we might be looking at. Okay, so remember, my electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract towards itself atoms, or sorry, to to attract towards itself electrons in covalent bonds. So if I look at electronegativity values of elements on the periodic table, fluorine has the very highest electronegativity. So it tends to pull electrons towards itself the strongest in covalent bonds. So it tends to be a very electron negative. So it's going to be my lower Greek letter delta negative in my molecules that I put it in. And other nonmetals will be much less electronegative, so they tend to be, if they're bonded to fluorine, be the delta positive region. Not a complete charge, not a cation and an anion, but just showing us that electrons are hanging out, spending more time around the fluorine side of the molecule and less time around the hydrogen side of the molecule. Now be careful not to confuse this with another term that we'll see also in the textbook called electron affinity. I'm going to focus in this chapter on electronegativity, but if you read about electron affinity later on, realize this is measured uh, with respect to free electrons in the gas phase and atoms in the gas phase and chlorine there has the highest electron affinity. Chlorine ends up if chlorine is atom ets here will have the highest electron affinity related to electrons being captured in the gas phase to form an anion. I'm not working with electron affinities right now, so don't focus on electron affinities. We're going to focus on electron negativities, drawing Lewis structures and predicting which elements we should put in the center of our Lewis structures. So what you might find useful is to print a copy of this electronegativity table with this, my electronegativities of common elements. You notice, as I said before, fluorine is the highest. Okay, and as we go from my non-metals to my metals, electronegativity is dropping. And as I go down the periodic table, my electronegativity is dropping. So as I go up, my metallic character is decreasing and electronegativity is increasing. And as I go from left to right, my metallic character is decreasing and my non-metal character is increasing and my electronegativity is increasing. And we can kind of remember this type of trend because if you consider that you have your uh, metalloid line that we're dealing with over here, if we're looking at that metalloid line, that kind of reminds us of the trend. As we go past through the metalloid line, our electronegativity is increasing. So as I go up, electronegativity is increasing. And as I go from left to right, my electronegativity is increasing. So that metalloid line is really useful in remembering this periodic trend. Now what I want to do is look at these differences in electronegativities. So if I have uh, fluorine bonded to hydrogen, I have a difference in electronegativity of 4 compared to a 2.1. If I take the larger electronegativity value and subtract the smaller of the electronegativity values, that difference will determine what type of bonding I have. If these values are close to 0, we have a very nonpolar type of situation with the covalent bond. As the differences become larger, we get polar covalent bonds, which may or may not result in polar molecules depending on the symmetry of the molecule and then if we end up with having very large differences between the electronegativities we might end up with ionic compounds. So here's the general rule to remember. If I have values that's the difference between the electronegativity values of the two elements between 0 to 0 0.1 we have a fairly pure or we might call it a nonpolar covalent bond that means that bond is not very polar the electrons are shared fairly equally between the two nonmetals in that bond now if we have the electronegativity difference that's 2.1 to 0 0.4 in the bond now that difference is no longer sharing electrons very equally we end up with having the higher value electronegativity being greater the lower value electronegativity being uh, the least electronegative and they end up having the electrons not shared equally. The more electronegative atom has more electron density, the least electronegative atom has the least electron density. So that was what we were seeing with the hydrogen fluoride polar molecule.
Now, however, if the value is roughly around 2 or greater, we end up with having ionic character. And so we predict that sodium chloride with its large difference. In fact, let's look at sodium and chlorine. If we take chlorine with a 3.0 electronegativity and sodium with a 0.9, if we take the difference, subtract 0.9 from 3, we get 2.1. So 2.1 would definitely be above the 2, roughly, that we're looking at for ionic compounds. So sodium chloride we would classify as ionic. Okay, so just realize the larger the difference in electronegativity, we go from covalent bonding, that's a pure covalent or nonpolar covalent, to more polar covalent where the electrons aren't shared equally, to if there's a very large difference in electronegativity, we maybe would transfer the electrons entirely to form cations and anions. Okay, now the reason we want to really be looking at electronegativity is in most of my Lewis electron dot structure of molecules, we frequently will want to choose an atom for the center of my structure that I draw that has a low electronegativity value and is capable of forming more than one uh, covalent bond. Okay, so we have to be careful about that. Notice that I said it has to be able to form more than one covalent bond. Now hydrogen has a low electronegativity value, and I just said if you have a low electronegativity negativity value, we often want to put an atom in the center of the molecule. However, hydrogen, since it only has the 1s subshell, can only form a single covalent bond, so it's a poor choice to put in the center of my Lewis structures. So hydrogens always go on the outside. They're only able to form one bond, so they're not a good choice if I want to bond multiple atoms. Now, however, if I have lower electronegativity values, let's say for carbon or nitrogen or phosphorus or sulfur, uh, compared to the other atoms that are bonded to them, usually if I can form multiple bonds between those atoms and the other nonmetals in the structure and there's a low electronegativity value I'm going to put it in the center. So let's practice this. Okay, So let's try here drawing a Lewis structure. Let's say we want to draw first of all a what we call a skeletal structure. Okay, The very first thing I do is put a low electronegativity atom in the center of my structure but I don't use hydrogen. So something other than hydrogen. Then I show that the other atoms in the structure which have a higher electronegativity value or can only form a single covalent bond like hydrogen would end up being on the outside. Okay. Then I want to count up a total number of valence electrons. Now I will have one valence electron present for every one of the valence electrons in my electron configurations plus if I have an anion. If I have an ion present, an anion for every negative charge in that ion would end up having an extra valence electron. Now if I have a cation, so let's say we have a polyatomic cation, every positive charge would indicate one less valence electron. So I have to correct for charge. Students will often forget this, so you might want to go ahead and make a note, don't forget to add extra electrons for negative charges on polyatomic ions and subtract electrons from my total for my count of valence electrons for every positive charge on a polyatomic cation. So examples of this as I would have to consider uh, adding an extra electron for the Lewis structure for perchlorate which is CO4 minus. So I add up all the valence electrons for one chlorine, four oxygens, and add one more for the charge of a negative. If I have, let's say, uh, the ammonium cation, NH4 plus, I want to, want to add up all the valence electrons for one nitrogen and four hydrogens, but I subtract one because of the positive charge on the polyatomic ion. So those are situations when we would take this rule into account. Now what I want to do then is draw my Lewis structure with covalent bonds between my nonmetals, and we would count two electrons for every covalent bond. Okay, so I would go ahead and, and draw that skeletal structure with at least a single covalent bond between the center atom and all the outer atoms. Okay, and then we want to make sure that once we've completed the octet of all the outer atoms by placing extra lone pairs or non-bonding pairs of electrons, that if we have any additional electrons, we want to put them on the central atom. Okay. Now if there aren't enough valence electrons to complete the octet of all the atoms in the structure, we can go ahead and share more electrons. That helps us in situations where the octets aren't being completed. And sometimes students will forget to make sure the octet rule is being followed. So make sure you double check that every atom has eight electrons around it if it's in the second or third period especially. And the exception to that would be like hydrogen. Hydrogen only needs a duet, only two. But other nonmetals would tend to want to have eight. Okay, so let's actually practice this with an example. Our example we're going to use is nitrogen trifluoride. So that's going to go ahead and be the structure I want. So the very first step to draw the Lewis structure for nitrogen trifluoride is we decide which is the least electronegative atom. 
and then we make sure it's not hydrogen because I can't put hydrogen in the center of my Lewis structure. But in this case, we don't have any hydrogen, so the less electronegative atom is the nitrogen because remember, fluorine is always going to be the most electronegative atom based on our electronegativity table. And so I put nitrogen in the center. So let's say I'm going to draw this Lewis structure. I put nitrogen in the center. Okay, I'm going to draw a skeletal structure. I'm going to have three fluorines. Okay, so I have one, two, three fluorines I'm looking at. So there's going to be a single covalent bond to each one of these. Okay. Now my skeletal structure hasn't shown any lone pairs, hasn't shown any non-bonding electrons. So this is my skeletal structure with that center less electronegative atom. My second step is I want to count up all my valence electrons that I had to build the whole structure out of. Okay, so if I look at nitrogens, nitrogens valence electron configuration has a 2s2 and 2p3. You notice I'm ignoring the core electrons. I only want to think about the valence electrons. So there's three, four, five valence electrons. So I have five valence electrons for nitrogen. If I look at fluorine, fluorine's electron configuration has a helium core, which I'm ignoring, and it has 2s2, 2p5. So there's five, six, seven, so I have seven valence electrons here. But I have three fluorines, so what I do is I take the five from the nitrogen. Since there's three fluorines, so I take the three fluorines times the seven valence electrons for each. So that's going to go ahead and give me 20, 21. And then I add the five to give me 26. So I have 26 valence electrons to draw my stretcher with. Now if I look at my skeletal stretcher, which only showed a single covalent bond holding everything together, I have only used six electrons. So if I subtract that from my total, from what I've drawn so far, I still have 20 electrons to be placed as lone pairs or non-bonding electrons to fill the octets and the valence shells of these molecules, or these atoms. So what I want to do here then is go ahead and complete the octets on the outer atoms first, the more electronegative atoms. So fluorines are more electronegative. I'm going to go ahead and fill their octets. So I'm going to put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So I placed another 18 electrons. So I use 18 more valence electrons. If I subtract that from the 20 I still had, I still have two more electrons that haven't been placed in the structure. Now what I want to do is look at my structure. Have I followed the octet rule on all these atoms? Well, each of the fluorines have eight electrons around them. One, two, three, four, five, six in non-bonding pairs. And then seven, eight to account for the two in each of the covalent bonds. Okay. Now what I want to do is since I haven't used all two of the electrons, I need to think where should it belong? Well, nitrogen doesn't have a full octet yet. If we count the number of electrons around nitrogen, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So it needs two more. So if we haven't used all the electrons, and if we have an atom which does not have a complete octet, then we want to place the extra electrons on the center atom. So remember though, give the outer atoms their octet first, then if we have extra electrons, we put them on the center. Now what would we do if we didn't have enough electrons to fill the octet on all of our atoms? In a situation like that, you want to be thinking, I should put double or triple bonds in, share more electrons to try to fill the valence shell of all the atoms involved. So we had seen that previously uh, with diatomic oxygen or diatomic nitrogen, but we'll nets, in our next video also practice this. So if we had drawn that Lewis structure, it should have looked something like this, where we end up using all 26 valence electrons. Okay, so make sure for next time that you can go ahead and determine the number of valence electrons for all of the elements that I've shown here in the S block on the periodic table and the P block for the main group elements. Next time we'll practice some additional Lewis structures. Okay, thank you very much. See you guys soon.